Welcome to Alaska Earthquake Science Facts. I'm Carl Tape. The 1964 Alaska earthquake lifted a 650 kilometer long offshore region of Alaska up by more than two meters permanently, and it dropped down a similar area of inland Alaska by one meter. Why does land go up or down during a subduction earthquake? This cartoon depicts on left our subduction setting of one plate going under another. So this would be Pacific plate going under the North America plate containing Alaska for us. Between earthquakes known as the interseismic period, the plates are stuck as it shows here. And the plate going down drags the upper plate downward, which bulges upward and is squeezed as shown here. During an earthquake, this upper plate rebounds. It goes up in this section and in the back area, farther away from the trench, it drops downward. And that type of motion can generate a tsunami for the purpose of this science fact. We're more interested in the permanent deformation it does to the land and the upper plate. This is depicted here in this 1994 paper and what it shows this elastic strain accumulation is you know, an exaggerated view of how the oceanic lithosphere is locked or stuck to the upper plate and it's dragging it downward, forming some compression and shortening and the causing uh, uplift in this area. But when the earthquake happens, this rebound, this upper plate goes upward and toward the trench here and it also drops down uh, beyond a certain uh, line. So you have this uplift and subsidence that happens during the earthquake. So this would be the part that's closer to the trench, and this would be the part that is further from the trench in the case of Alaska, the mainland. The 1964 earthquake lifted up the offshore region shown here and drop down the inland region, shown here in blue labeled subsidence. Another depiction of this cut through a block shows the Pacific plate being subducted. You can kind of see a cross section cut away here. And the part that goes up is shown out here in pink. And we'll also be interested in the part further from the trench that went down. These observations of uplift and subsidence were the core geological information that went into a seminal paper published in Science, June 25th, 1965 by George Plafker. As it says, the earthquake resulted in observable crustal deformation of unprecedented aerial extent. In other words, a large area uh, was deformed. In this case, up and down is the main story. This shows uh, his published map and the contour says inferred zone of maximum uplift. So these are the parts that went up shown here. And then the negative number shown here uh, in meters would show the, the part that went down. Some things went up as we could see from that map and we'll see what some of those pictures look like. Former seafloor at Cape Clear Montague Island exposed by 26 feet or eight meters of tectonic uplift. So the old shoreline was way out here and the new shoreline is now way out here. So all of this material, which used to be underwater has now come up off the seafloor. And what you see here was previously underwater material exposed to air. So it's a really stunning picture of, of uplift. Here's another example, 5.7 feet or 1.7 meters of measured uplift. And these barnacles here used to be underwater and are no longer.
and some things went down. Here's the inundation of Portage, Alaska near Girdwood along Turnigan Arm. And the flooding here at high tide was caused by tectonic subsidence of about two meters during the earthquake. Just a reminder that this is not flooding due to a tsunami. This is flooding due to an area of land that was close to sea level, but is now uh, below sea level, at least during certain tides. And this is the consequence of subsidence during the earthquake. A spectacular before after photo appeared in Atwater's 2015 publication showing at left summer 1964. This is the Portage Garage. High tide covers recently subsided land. Label here says spruce trees dying, spruce drying. And here's a photo taken in 1998. Even today, you can still see the remnants of the garage shown here. Here's a person for scale. Shrubs cover the land that was rebuilt by the tidal silt. And here it says, few trunks still standing. The forest, the trees here, they all died. They all died when the water came in and the water came in because the ground dropped down. And so it's a really uh, elegant example of subsidence near sea level. Here's a cartoon associated with the process. You have a tree before the earthquake that is near sea level, but not not getting inundated by any tidal um, high tides or anything like that. So here's a spruce tree soil. The land subsides during the earthquake, it drops down. And then several months after the earthquake, this salty water is soaking into the soil. And you can imagine as a dramatic change for this tree and is killing it. And as time goes on, several decades go on, more silt is deposited. The tree trunk uh, may, may be preserved in this form, and this is what the ghost forest is. It's anchored down to a layer of material that marks the time in a matter of minutes where the ground dropped down and changed things forever in that area. This shows a photograph uh, taken from the Girdwood area of these ghost forests, and you can see what I like in the background. There's Turnigan Arm. That's showing you the sea level and also these, these large uh, mountains as a backdrop. So these are all trees that died in 1964 during the earthquake due to subsidence. Here's another photograph, uh, ghost forest of trees killed due to subsidence. And here again, you see a similar view of the trees and near sea level. These photos were taken with a bunch of geologists and seismologists on a field trip to go check out um, how you can scientifically investigate these. Again, same area near Girdwood with the view of some of these ghost trees, not too high above of sea level in this case. Great shot shown in the mud flats with these trees um, growing down in a layer that would have been um, higher up prior to the 1964 earthquake, but then drop down. And so this shows a core of something you can push down into the earth to collect samples and possibly see to even earlier earthquakes in the past, such as the one that was before the 1964 earthquake. Those trees were Part of the evidence for the discovery of the 1700 Pacific Northwest earthquake. This is a magnitude nine earthquake that we now know occurred in January 1700. This shows the title of the article, article Sudden Probably Co Seismic Submergence of Holocene Trees and Grass in Washington. This shows a paper a couple years later in Nature tree ring dating the 1700 Cascadia earthquake. And there it's even more sophisticated piece of the story where first of all, you have trees that live a really long time in this part. This is showing one from the year 993 to 1986. There's trees that died prior to the 1700 earthquake such as this one labeled snag. And even on some of those, they have a bark bearing root that continued to grow but then was killed with the inundation of water uh, 
from subsidence in the earthquake. So um, kind of a different extension of this story, but the main principle is that in certain areas, the land dropped down, killing trees that were near sea level. Takeaway topics. Between earthquakes, the upper plate is locked to the subducting plate and is slowly dragged landward and downward. So that's the interseismic period that is kind of the normal, uh, normal events. During a subduction earthquake, the upper plate rebounds oceanward and experiences uplift toward the trench and subsidence landward. Ghost forests are dead trees that were near sea level and killed when the land level dropped down. Ghost forests from 1964 can be seen near Seward and Girdwood in Alaska. Careful dating of living and dead trees near coastal settings can help identify historical earthquakes. Thank you for watching. Stick around for supplemental material.